On the 9th of April, 1945, a month before Germany's surrender and the end of the Second World War, the execution of one of the most influential 20th century theologians took place. Born in early 20th century Germany, Dietrich Bonhoeffer would come to live through both the First World War as a young child and the Second as an adult and refined theologian. Both of these global events would have life-changing effects on Bonhoeffer, both in terms of his theological career and his Christian faith. In this video, we will explore Bonhoeffer's biography, as well as take a look at his theological stance as it relates to his ethics. Bonhoeffer grew up in a sort of relaxed Christian household. This is not to say his family did not take the religion seriously, but rather that any form of forced religion was rejected by his parents. The family still observed Christian customs in the form of daily prayers and hymns, as well as celebrating the holidays. The Bonhoeffer family's stance on religion and religious practices may not be unsurprising when considering their tendency for prestige. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's father, Karl Bonhoeffer, was a neurologist, psychiatrist, and physician, while two of the children went on to pursue careers such as chemistry and law. It was this environment that would eventually lead Bonhoeffer's family to be skeptical of his decision to pursue theology. This is to say that even though Bonhoeffer had the full support of his family, they believed he had the potential to pursue a more challenging profession. It is not particularly known how Bonhoeffer came to the decision to study theology, but Eberhard Wedke, his friend and biographer, makes note of Bonhoeffer's unwavering ambition to pursue a life of ministry early on in his life. The most prominent idea that may have driven Bonhoeffer to a life of theology and ministry, however, lies in the events of the final years of the First World War. In his biography of Bonhoeffer, Wedke writes the following. The events of the final years of the war had a deep effect on him. His early memories of the Breslau Cemetery gained a personal immediacy through the loss of his brother and how his mother had succumbed to her grief. His childish spirit responded with a fervent longing for the life beyond, and a fervent, though unarticulated, wish to convey his unqualified faith in eternity to the others. A key component of Bonhoeffer's theology is that it cannot be separated from his life. What Bonhoeffer wrote he also lived. This is to say that Bonhoeffer failed to see a separation between his life and his Christian faith. In the same way, Bonhoeffer's various theological ideas cannot be separated from one another either, as they each add a piece to the same theological puzzle Bonhoeffer developed. It truly comes across as if Bonhoeffer had a complete comprehension of his theological ideas before he even started writing his literature. Before diving deeper into Bonhoeffer's theology, we must first do a brief overview of two theological concepts. First, the infinite qualitative distinction, a concept coined by Soren Kierkegaard. On the simplest level, the infinite qualitative distinction posits that God and humanity are infinitely different. This implies that any comparison between the qualities of the finite human and the infinite supreme being is impossible. The infinite qualitative distinction is also seemingly influenced by apophatic theology, but we can leave that for another video. The second concept we need to highlight comes from Karl Barth. An excerpt from Michael de Jong's Boniface Theological Formation, Berlin, Barth and Protestant Theology, explains that Barth maintained a distinction between humanity and the divine, which was informed by his dialectical viewpoint and approach. De Jong explains that, even during Revelation and in the Incarnation, God remains God and humanity remains humanity. It is this understanding of Revelation which Barth's dialectical thinking is designed to respect. Barth thinks dialectically, both affirming and denying that God and humanity come together in order to respect the distinction between God and humanity, 
which is finally overcome only on the other side of eternity. Here we can see that Bart affirms Kierkegaard's infinite qualitative distinction, which is then compounded by Bart's top-down approach. When it came to Christian ethics, Bart believed it to be the task of theological ethics to understand the word of God as the command of God. In this way, all ethical decisions ought to be made through comprehension of the word of God, which is the command of God. We may note here that Bart's understanding of the word of God is highly nuanced, but for the sake of this video, it is just important to understand that Bart's ethics starts from God's command. Boniface shared in Bart's agreement with the infinite qualitative distinction and in the authority of God. However, Boniface Christian ethics does more for what we can call the human element. In 1929, Bonhoeffer travelled from Germany to New York, where he studied under Reinhold Niebuhr. It is this experience that would see Bonhoeffer transform his favourite view of divine transcendence to be more inclusive of the concrete reality. Prior to his study at the Union Theological Seminary, Bonhoeffer's view of ethics was mostly theoretical and excluded the human element. It was Niebuhr's Christian realism that would influence Bonhoeffer the most as he started recognizing the usefulness of theology from the point of view of the people who struggled and were in need. Niebuhr would urge Bonhoeffer to bridge the gap between theological theory and theology in the concrete reality. It was more than likely because of Bonhoeffer's time in New York that he would part ways with Bart in certain aspects of theological ethics. Where Bart considered God's command, along with the word of God, to be the final authority, Bonhoeffer recognizes the place of humankind within the world. In his book titled Ethics, Bonhoeffer writes the following. No one can give themselves authorization for ethical discourse. Rather, it is granted to and bestowed on people, not primarily because of their subjective achievements and distinctions, but because of their objective position in the world. Thus, it is the old person, and not the young, the parent, and not the child, the master, and not the servant, the teacher, and not the student, the judge, and not the defendant, the governing authority, and not the subject, the preacher, and not the parish parishioner, to whom the authorization for ethical discourse is granted. At first glance, it may appear that Bonhoeffer is advocating for a divided world, where some have more authority than others. However, what Bonhoeffer is really asserting is that every person is the captain of their own ship. Each person knows their own life situation and their own context the best, so it stands to reason that they are the best person to authorize ethical decisions for their own lives. Where ethical decisions impact more than the individual, however, experience becomes a defining criterion as to whom ethical authority is granted. By emphasizing both the individual's autonomy and experience as a factor in the ability to make confident ethical decisions, Bonhoeffer inaugurates his concept of personal responsibility. This is compounded by Bonhoeffer's understanding of experience, which is earned through responsibility of the other rather than the self. In this way, when one has to make a decision that has an ethical layer to it, those who are affected by the decision are the same people who the decision maker is responsible for, be it himself alone, or many others. Joel Banman, in his book, Life in the Humanity of Christ, Theological Anthropology and the Ethics of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, gives us a good idea of how to understand this. For Bonhoeffer, ethics becomes real only in the moment of responsibility, the moment of being addressed by the concrete other, and this ethical barrier between persons actually generates human personhood. If we now return to Bonhoeffer's life situation that was Germany during the Second World War, we can easily see the self-application of his ethics. One such example is in Bonhoeffer's preachings in London, where he was approached by the German bishop of foreign ministry, Theodor Heckel, to end his exploits and abstain from any ecumenical activities not authorized by Berlin. Bonhoeffer refused this request. Bonhoeffer's stance did not change, and in 1936, Heckel deemed him a pacifist and revoked his authorization to teach at the University of Berlin. This did not change Bonhoeffer's stance and merely forced him to change his approach in ministry, to be done without the knowledge of the state. 
These underground ministries allowed Bonifa to still continue preaching as well as keep in contact with his various students. Bonifa understood his responsibility and his decisions in continuing his practice reflected that. It is this reverent ethical stance through acceptance of his own responsibility that would lead to Bonifa's imprisonment and eventual execution. <laughs>